our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, ben Blythe from Peter Mac, who is heading the Translational uh, Cancer Research. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as with Shanine, I'd like to pick a really uh, vague, broad title, Advances in Preclinical Theranostic Discovery, really is an opportunity to just give some introductions to the types of strategies that we're undertaking within the preclinical theranostic department um, here at Peter Mac. Um, so I'd like to start, um, of course, with the acknowledgements of the people who did uh, much of the work in this study, um, particularly to the uh, TRC team, um, and of course to the people who funded the work. Uh, so I'd like to start off by talking about a recent publication, um, not to really go through uh, specific details, but really to just discuss the strategy that we've undertaken in this work. And so what this is, is a genome-wide CRISPR screen in the radionuclide therapy setting. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, what a genome-wide CRISPR knockout screen does is it allows us to take a population of cells and to randomly knock out a single gene in each individual cell within the population. So it's completely at random. Every different cell within this population will lose a gene. And then what we do is we put that population of cells under a stress, in this case, um, exposure to lutetium octreotate. And what we see is how those different cells with the different single gene knockouts respond. Does that cell population decrease in proportion to the original mix, or does it expand? And that tells us something about whether or not loss of that gene causes a survival advantage or makes it more susceptible to that stress. And so what we do is that we expose the cell population for four hours to lutate, then they're washed, and then they're cultured um, for a period of time, and we track what happens to each of those individual cells. And so what we were able to find is that we had to first do a lot of work to try and pick the right dose to expose. Because if you completely wipe out the population, there are no cells left, which isn't very informative. And if you don't place on enough stress, then most of what you're seeing are just the effects of the gene knockouts on normal cell survival parameters. So there was a lot of work that went into picking the right kind of dose, where we get a significant restriction of the population under stress, um, but allows us to see genes that both increase or decrease survival. And so what we were able to see is from two independent screens, in the black are shown what happens for these genes uh, in the absence of lutate treatment. So we can see that different genes shown down the bottom here do not show any significant enrichment or depletion in the absence of lutate. This is really important because we know that if we knock out a gene and it just kills the cell anyway, then it's not really looking at a resistance or a sensitivity phenotype. So we wanted to exclude genes that just affect cell survival on their own. The dark blue and light blue show genes that either made the cells more sensitive or more resistant to lutate. And what I'd like you to get from the graph on the right here is just to show that the longer we kept these cells in culture, the more that significance increased. So we're able to see an ongoing um, either depletion or enrichment of these cells. And so we chose that 21 day time point um, as the uh, point of the assay going forward. So if we now look at the genes that came up in the sensitivity screen, so these are genes that made the cells more sensitive to the lutate therapy. If we do a gene ontology analysis, to rather than looking at individual genes, we look at what these genes do, you can see that we have a 75 to 100-fold enrichment um, compared to random expectations of genes that are involved in frank DNA double-strand break repair. So this is quite um, nice in terms of validating the screen. We would expect that would be something that would um, make cells more sensitive to lutate exposure. And what you can see in the graph uh, at the bottom is again just showing how we're selecting genes, uh, gene knockouts that make the cells more sensitive to lutate without affecting the survival of the cells on their own. Because we don't want to find genes that just kill all cells. We want to find uh, genes that when knocked out enhance the sensitivity to lutate specifically. If you look at the dots highlighted in green, these shows those that are in the DNA double strand break repair um, pathway. So you can see the majority of the targets in that blue box um, are these green highlighted genes. And if we take those specific green dots, what you can see is they represent um, targets that are very much focused on a single pathway. You can see the classical Q70 and 80, DNA PKCS, uh, those genes in the MRN complex, Artemis, ligase 4, XRCC4, and XLF. So all of the genes in this pathway, when you knock them out, <clears throat> make the cells exquisitely sensitive to the lutate exposure without affecting the survival of the untreated cells. 
So this was really interesting to us to really see that we could go in not with a specific hypothesis that DNA repair would make them sensitive. This was a completely unbiased screen. We knock out all genes in the whole genome and these are the ones that come out. Uh, there are other genes as well, but this is just focusing here just to illustrate how this technique can be used. And so the next thing we want to do is we want to validate, does this actually make sense? Did it just come up in the screen or is this a real thing? And so what you can see on the left is now if we take a cell line and we just do a single knockout of the DNA PK uh, gene, we can see that we can sensitize the cells specifically to two different doses of lutate shown on the left. And importantly, not just a genetic knockout on the left, but on the right, we have two different pharmacological inhibitors of DNA-PK, which both elicit the same response. So we can use a drug that inhibits DNA-PK and see the same um, sensitization of the cells to the lutate therapy in culture. So this was really exciting to see that that screen comes up with ideas that really help us to move forward. So what do we need to do next? Well, we need to show that it actually works in practice. And so we have here a, a mouse model of a tumour that is uh, highly sensitive to lutate. So you can see in the red line that lutate therapy on its own is very effective in this tumour setting. But when we add one of these DNA-PK pharmacological inhibitors, we can see a significant um, increase in both the survival, um, but also you can see that tumour growth delay. So again, this is really nice to be able to see that we can identify something from an unbiased screen, we can check it at a genetic level, we can check it at the pharmacological inhibitor level in vitro, and then we can see that it works in a mouse model um, of radionuclide therapy. But of course, we don't want to just improve uh, responses to effective radionuclide therapy. One of the things we'd like to be able to do is to convert those people that have this primary resistance. How can we take tumours that don't respond well to radionuclide therapy and push them further? So this is an example here of showing a tumour that isn't responsive to lutate therapy. But when we add this DNA-PK inhibitor, we are now able to convert this tumour from lutetium insensitive to lutetium sensitive and see this increase in tumour survival. Um, so this is all part of a larger program uh, funded here by the Australian Cancer Research Foundation's Radiation Immuno-Oncology Program, where we're really now trying to tie these radionuclide uh, therapy responses to how we can integrate them with the immune system. So this is just another piece of work here showing a, a collaborative approach from our group looking at intrapulmonary injection of cells, in this case cells that express somatostatin receptor in an immune competent setting. So we can see this individual uh, focus of disease uh, within the lung that we can detect on a GAT8 scan in the mouse. And not only can we see this disease in a GAT8 scan, but we can also then follow the progression from the lung to metastases within the liver. So we can use PET scanning to follow the progression of this disease in an immune competent setting. We can identify those lesions and it gives us now the opportunity to incorporate immunotherapy into the radionuclide therapy setting to be able to see how it uh, changes both the primary lesion but also the progression to metastasis. And another model that's being developed um, as part of uh, the tactical program that's been uh, mentioned a couple of times already this morning um, is to find other immune competent uh, disease settings to be able to make these explorations. And so one of these is using a transgenic model of prostate disease. And we can see in this case that if we now add in uh, the terbium-161 PSMA INT as uh, is being used in the violet preclinical uh, study, we can see that we're able to see that the ligand um, finds the sites of disease and PSMA expression within this transgenic model. So this is just another example of the way we're trying to uh, pull models together that allow us to look at this combina combination radionuclide immunotherapy. You can see in brown staining is where the PSMA is overexpressed within this uh, prostate tissue. And you can see that this corresponds to the site of where we get the most uptake of the terbium-161 radioligand. So just to conclude, uh, you know, the types of approaches that we're really focusing on are these novel traces and radionuclides, um, but also looking at these mechanisms to be able to confer tumour radiosensitivity and also the combination with immunotherapy. So thank you very much for your attention.